uh, well, it's really nice to be here. Thank you for having me. I, I um, you know, I feel, you know, uh, a little bit out of fish out of water. I'm, I'm, I'm an academic and I'm really industry adjacent, but uh, I've been learning a lot by talking to people here. Um, so uh, just first thing about my disclosure. So uh, I've lived in the Bay Area for 22 years and somehow never had a stock option, which is really sad, <laughs> but, but I, um, I am a faculty member. I do work for the government, I guess, dollar bills are kind of like government stock options a little bit. And I've been the site PI for these two sponsored trials, as well as um, a, a new study with a company that we're going to, it's an investigator initiated trial. And then I also have been a paid consultant for two companies. And, you know, I got into this space about 10 years ago. Uh, I, I continue to have a whole program of research around um, oxytocin, giving people oxytocin. I like to say oxytocin was my gateway drug. Um, and I, you know, oxytocin has been pretty interesting and, you know, has some interesting uh, phenomenon, but it's pretty subtle effects. And, you know, as a psychiatrist who still sees veterans, um, you know, I don't think I need to make much of a case that we need new treatments. I think now many people are talking about this. There is no real... I don't think there's a single mental illness that we're like, yep, we've cured that, no problem, that's done. Uh, the treatments we have are insufficient, you know, don't work for everybody, take a long time. Um, you know, this may be not news for 95% of you, but psilocybin is pretty exciting, you know, people, <laughs> people have been talking about it. Uh, I guess what I'll say here is that, you know, people have been using it for many thousands of years. I really like this um, picture here. This is from a cave in Tunisia. Algeria, one of those. Um, and people call it the, the beheaded shaman. Uh, and it's it's thought to be one of the first uh, cave art that sort of suggests people have been using uh, psilocybin mushrooms. I don't know if you can see in this picture, but it does look like there's psilocybin mushrooms all over the person's arms and they have two fistfuls of them. And, you know, the, the head is a bee. And, and so, you know, the idea is that people have been using this for various purposes for a long time. Um, just to give you a sense, uh, of what people experience on, on psilocybin when we try and qu quantify it. Uh, they, gave, they gave psilocybin to healthy people. Oh gosh, my, my graphics kind of messed up, but I think you get the same idea. You can see that, um, let's see if this is gonna work. yeah, you can see basically the farther, the farther the line is away from the center, the more people report in that domain. And you can see there's a dose response effect with psilocybin, like, like Daniel was saying that you know, it depends on how much you take and you can have things, you know, there's synesthesia, you know, seeing sounds and such, visual, vivid imagery. And then there's also this experience of unity. This is something that people talk a lot about, this mystical experience where you have the full dissolution of the self-other boundary. A lot of groups say that that's really important. Um, uh, yeah. And then to give you something to compare it to, here's ketamine, you know, often talked about in the same breath. It actually not as different as one would expect, given that as a dissociative anesthetic, there is much more disembodiment, which you'd expect, but there still is this uh, unity experience. Um, so, you know, it isn't as different in the subjective effects as uh, I would have thought. Uh, just another thing to say that, this, you know, maybe this is also preaching to the choir, but if you, if you look at the active over lethal dose and the how often, you know, the dependency potential, you can see that psychedelics are way down here. Um, you know, people don't really escalate their dose the way people do other, you know, alcohol or cocaine. And you have to take a, a lot to, to kill yourself, um, as opposed to some of our other popular ones. You, can, you know, again, I don't think I have to make much of a case that, that alcohol is a fairly dangerous legal thing with um, legal dispensary uh, places called bars. Right? Um, yeah, so there's a little slide. Okay, so... Uh, you know, we, there's been a lot of talk here about how people use psilocybin and like how it will be used in, as a treatment. And you know, there are lots of debate about this. I'm going to be talking about one model and maybe, again, people know about this model, but um, this is the one that's been used the most in these sort of academic trials, the modern trials. So uh, what, what these trials do, they use a high dose of psychedelic psilocybin and try to harness and shape the set and setting, the mindset that people have going into this, and then the setting in which they, they use it. And so you take your, the person comes in and they meet with a facilitator or a therapist or 
you know, <laughs> it's one of the, this old joke about how academics would rather use each other's toothpaste than their toothbrushes than their nomenclature. So every group has a different nomenclature for what these people are. Are they sitters? Are they guides? Are they facilitators? Are they therapists? I'll use all the different terms, uh, but I think of them as therapists. Uh, and they prepare, they talk about what's gonna happen. They, there's a lot of psychoeducation. There's talking about often setting an intention about what you might experience on the drug. And then um, they come in and they have a psilocybin session or several. Uh, and you know, early in the morning, they take the pill. They're encouraged to go internal. They wear eye shades, listen to music. And they sit in, they lay down in this room, typically uh, outfitted like a, like a nice psychotherapy office. Uh, with a therapist or two and are encouraged to have an internal experience. Now, they don't usually stay in there for the whole eight hours. Often they come back and they check in. They have to go to the bathroom occasionally. Um, and, but the, and the therapists, again, typically two, sit there with them. And then integration is thought to be really important. So this is typically starts the next day and goes on for maybe six or eight hours over a couple of weeks where the person comes back and talks about what they experienced in the high dose psychedelic, tries to integrate it with, with what's, you know, their lives and what they've taken from it and try and come up with something that they can take forward with them. Okay, so uh, let's see, is this gonna work? Okay, so this is a video. Guys, so this is a video, um, not my video, this is a video from- High quality. Beautiful music player. Okay, can you pause it for a second? Lying in the sofa. Yeah, great. So um, this is from a study. That I didn't do it. It's at Hopkins. You probably heard about this study. This is a study where they took people who had existential distress, who were had life-threatening cancer, and they gave them this kind of paradigm. And this is a, a man who's a, I think he's a chemistry professor who was uh, dealing with uh, prostate cancer. And he'll just talk a little bit about what the experience was. So if you could just play it. My two guides sitting there quietly, supportively. And what it led to was a reawakening, what it felt like when my first daughter, Tanya, died. And the feelings just came flooding up. I was completely into the strongest sense of despair and loss that I had after she died. And I howled. And I felt comforted that my guides won't, they won't come and comfort me. They won't stop me. They'll let me go into it. And I did. And um, that sort of almost 30 years of not denial, but putting it down, suppressing how that felt. And that was very liberating. After that, the experience with the drug, it became even more potent. Everything was animate. Um, like sitting here, all us around, it's, it's, it's animate. Celebrating being part of this incredible living experience that we have. Humans are not separate from nature. And how, whatever happens to my bodily parts, they will go back into nature too. You know, this video. So I, I like this video because he describes a lot of the aspects that are pretty typical in these, these trials. This you know, uh, intense experience, this flooding of emotions, this uh, processing of traumas from before that were not really the focus. They, they didn't say bring up things from a long time ago. Sensibly, he was in this because of his own cancer. Um, and then also that feeling of uh, being connected to the universe or you know, being connected to nature. These are all themes that, that come up a lot. Um, and, and yeah, so that, and, and that's, that's been our experience uh, doing this work uh, in our lab too. I just, I just don't have videos of that. <laughs> so um, not changing gears exactly, but sort of going next, I was, I was asked to talk about you know, why are people talking about psychedelics for substance use disorders? Um, so uh, let's see. There we go. So, well, one place to start is that, you know, Bill Wilson, you know, the, you know, one of the founders of AA, he 
used LSD and said it was very helpful to him. And you know, that, he said that that inspired him to make AA. That, you know, so that's one you know, anecdote. Back in the 60s and 70s, there were trials of various psychedelics for substance use disorders. Um, they didn't have modern clinical trial design, so it's often not clear what disorder the person had or who was followed or what exactly happened. So you know, it's a little bit murky, but people were definitely doing this. Um, you know, here is just one modern meta-analysis of these studies. This is LSD for alcohol use disorder. And you can see, you know, they had big effect sizes, but it, it's hard to interpret. I would say that there's mostly just lots and lots of open label trials, but still. Um, more recently, uh, there's been some survey data. So again, this is anecdotal data, but lots and lots of anecdotal data. So a group at Hopkins um, created an international survey and they asked people, um, they, they asked people, have you used a, a psychedelic to um, overcome alcohol or drug addiction? So they were looking, they were explicitly looking for people who, who said that they had experienced that. And they found 343 adults uh, who, who did this for alcohol. And these people had, you know, by their self-report, had had pretty severe alcohol use disorder um, problems. Uh, and then they said they, they used a, a psychedelic and then their alcohol use went away for the most part. And they, again, just like the patient I just showed you, most of them reported that it was due to a very significant experience that they had on the psychedelic. Um, and, you know, they also said that it let, um, that their life had changed as well, that their priorities had changed, uh, and that also helped them reduce their alcohol use. They did a, a path analysis, and what you can see here is, you know, people who had worse alcohol use disorder, they had a bigger change, which I think you see a lot of. Um, this was related to how much distress they had about their alcohol use. Um, the dose seemed to matter, so people who reported taking more were more likely to have a change. Um, and then people, people described how much insight they had during the experience and how much mystical experience. And that's, you know, the self-other disillusion. And so those seem to be um, related to how much better people got. They, the, it was the same survey, but they separated out the people who had got better with alcohol, which I just showed you. And then they also looked at people who got better on uh, opioids and stimulants. And so they found 444 people who reported using psychedelics to help them with that. Um, you know, they, they you know, had severe illness, self-report, and then they reported a lot of uh, decrease in this. And uh, again, reported as highly meaningful and that these things that changed, changed in their values for their life. And they did another path analysis and it, it looked pretty similar in that people, how much insight and, and uh, mystical experience they had led to this experience of personally meaningful change let them use less drugs. But again, this is all retrospective and all survey. In the modern era, there have been two published uh, trials. Um, this is the one with alcohol use disorders. They, it was an open label trial and it's a uh, combined treatment. So people got, you know, um, I think it was eight weeks of psychotherapy around uh, alcohol use disorder with two dosing sessions in, interspersed in there. Um, and uh, like followed people for 36 weeks. And what you can see on the first dose was low, medium dose, and the second dose was a high dose. And you can see people are drinking and then they get the first dose and they drink less and then they get the second dose and they drink even less. And that continues for, uh, I can't actually see from here, uh, for 36 weeks. So this was a, you know, a good early signal, but open label and um, very small sample. But these people did have a long history of alcohol use disorder. So it fit with the other data that people had been seeing. Uh, then there's also this smoking cessation study. So again, they took people who had tried to quit smoking for a, a bunch of times uh, over their life. And they, again, they gave them this pretty big intervention, this 15 week um, motivational interviewing um, intervention. And then they interspersed two or three dosing sessions of escalating doses of psilocybin. And you can see, oops. You can see people are, you know, smoking at baseline, and then they get very dramatic quit, rate, quit rates. So people really stopped smoking. Again, open label, but dramatic, kind of like a, you know, uh, you know, the 
old joke about, you know, you show up with a singing pig and you're like, well, it's only one, but you're like, but it's a, it's a pig that sings, right? So like, you know, this is a pretty dramatic change in smoking behavior and people who had failed a lot of other ways. So there's a lot of excitement about that. And now that, you know, as you, I think most of the people here know, there's lots of trials that are ongoing, but they haven't been published yet. I want to tell you about a study that we did locally. Now it's not about substance use, but I'm proud of it. I think it's interesting and relevant. So um, this is a picture of the San Francisco Gay Men's Cult Choir. Uh, and uh, the people in white represent orig our original members, whereas the people in black represent people who died during the AIDS epidemic. So it just gives you a sense of the kind of devastation that AIDS had in this particular population at a particular time. Um, you know, uh, if you were diagnosed with HIV before 1996, it was a death sentence. Everyone expected to die. Most people did die. And it wasn't just any death sentence. It was actually a um, stigmatized death sentence, right? It wasn't just that you were going to die. It was a gay men's disease. You know, Ronald Reagan wouldn't even mention it. People wouldn't touch you. Apparently in San Francisco, like you couldn't get on the bus. There were all sorts of horrible stuff about this. But some people who got diagnosed before 1996 didn't die. So they either were genetic non-progressors or the timing was such that they were able to get um, treatment. The, the medication came around just in time to, to save their lives. However, those people who survived, and now as you know, HIV is a different kind of illness, it's a chronic illness, but those people who survived and went through that, most of them have a lot of sequelae of this, you know, this chronic existential distress, co complex grief, and many of them describe isolation and loneliness, depression, and perhaps paradoxically risky substance use and sex. Um, and we wanted to, you know, we were going to do our first pilot study of, of, of psilocybin, and we wanted to focus on this group um, for a couple of reasons. One, it was, you know, these people are alive and are suffering, and it's near and dear to our heart at UCSF. But also, we saw it as a model, right, um, that, you know, uh, people who've gone through some mass horrible thing like war or genocide or, or the Holocaust, um, natural disasters. And we wanted to see, well, could we help them? People who actually weren't dying any faster than other people, but whose death had been hanging over their heads for a long time. Now, I know that doesn't fit in the DSM, but that's what we were thinking at the time anyway. Um, and so what did we do? Well, we did this open label psilocybin-assisted group psychotherapy. And that's, that was the other innovation we did. We did group for the prep and integration. And why did we do that? Well, a bunch of reasons. Um, I think some of them are, are themes that we're, people were talking about in this meeting. We thought, you know, the two therapy model is very expensive and costly, you know, it's costly and time consuming. We thought, well, if we're gonna help, if we're trying to help people not be socially isolated, why make them go outside of the treatment, right? Turns out at Hopkins, they, they had let this anecdote out that many of their participants really wanted to speak to the other participants in the study. And I think, as all of you know, like that hardly ever happens. Like nobody in a Prozac trial is like, oh my God, I really want to talk to the other people who got Prozac. You know, that doesn't, doesn't happen, right? <laughs> so, so we thought that was pretty interesting. And we thought, you know, this could be an efficient way to deliver the treatment and actually maybe equally effective or even more effective because the, the group could do the work. Um, we could decrease the, the therapist time. Uh, and also, you know, historically or, in, in, you know, indigenous practices involve a lot of group delivery of this, ayahuasca circles, um, for example, and other indigenous practices. So we, we decided to do it that way. And we recruited 18 people, gay identified men, we were long-term AIDS survivors. And we used, uh, again, another sort of non-standard thing. We, our primary outcome was demoralization, which is from the, the palliative care. Uh, world. You can think of it as related to depression, but it's much more focused on this existential distress, being stuck, if you will. And here's our study design. So, you know, people came into the study, you know, doing a group study, you, you kind of have to hold people as you recruit more. So you get them all to start at the same time. So that's kind of a drag, but you know, we had to do that. And then we would do our assessment. Then they had four prep sessions. <laughs> then they dosed individually. We, we didn't really have the capability to dose altogether, you know, like a rave or something. We didn't have that, but it's, you know, it's an interesting idea, but, but we dosed each person on a different day and we tried to do it as fast as possible so that they could come back together uh, for their integration. And we did four to six integration sessions. And then we followed them up for three months. Um, just a little bit about who was in the study. 
average age was about 60. This is something very dramatic, right? If you, we ask people, how many people did you, did you lose? Uh, and you can see there's a huge range, uh, as many as 100 people uh, to the AIDS epidemic, but on average about 26. Just another little thing that people were saying that, you know, some of the stories we heard was like, that when, when this was happening, you know, you would have multiple funerals a week, and that was pretty typical. Um, and then there was a lot of variability in how many times they had used psychedelics. The other thing, you know, we, we still did DSM diagnosis, even though that wasn't an inclusion criteria. And you can see we had a lot of variability. We had some people who, a lot of depression, um, uh, anxiety. We had three people who met criteria for borderline personality disorder. Some people had high PTSD symptoms. A bunch of people didn't meet a criteria, a criteria for a DSM diagnosis. Also, three of the people had a history of methamphetamine use disorder. Uh, so here's our, you know, um, demoralization, it was high. We treated them with psilocybin, it was low, it stayed low. Open label study, but still a big, a big effect size. We didn't pick people for high PTSD symptoms, but we saw a similar kind of pattern there. Another thing we looked at was attachment. So, you know, this is from, you know, uh, there's a long history of, of research into attachment styles, which are, the, you know, the patterns of behavior you get set up early in life. Genetics also play a role. And while they're not like having high attachment anxiety or avoidance, which are the two orthogonal dimensions, they're not psycho, they're not pathological in and of themselves. They do put you at risk for many different uh, psychopathologies, and they're traditionally very difficult to change. People can change them with intensive psychotherapy, um, but it usually is intensive. We found that, um, oh, I guess you can't really see that. <laughs> we found that, you know, our population had attached high attachment anxiety, which is to be expected, and that we had a significant decrease in that uh, over the treatment, which we were excited about because it suggested that maybe we could use these treatments to maybe allow for these changes in this personality structure. Um, I think we've, other group, other people have talked a lot about sort of the proposed mechanisms of, of psilocybin, you know, molecularly. Um, there is this whole story about neuroplasticity and neurogenesis. You know, this is from one of the papers. You can, you know, I'm not an expert in all this, but you can see that, you know, treating, treating in vitro cells with uh, psychedelics, you can increase the number of uh, dendritic spines and um, synaptic density. It's pretty cool. <laughs> and then, you know, there's, a lot of the work, a lot of the effects are through the 5-HT2A receptor, including the hallucinatory effects, and um, there's dopaminergic effects as well as this, you know, interesting story about the compensatory uh, m glue R2. Um, but I, I won't get too much into that. There's also this whole circuit uh, story about the mechanism. This is an older paper, but I think it shows a nice uh, effect where they they took people and they looked at the various, you know. Uh, resting state networks, so these these networks of the brain that typically are resonating with each other, and then they correlated them with each other. So you can see, you know, on placebo, you know, some of these networks, one and two, for example, they typically kind of go in sync, and some of them are typically out of sync. That's in blue. Um, and then what they did is they gave people psilocybin or MDMA, and you can see there's more red here, which means more of these networks are now correlating with each other than on placebo. And that didn't happen for uh, MDMA. And then this just shows you the contrast. This, you know, this, this kind of idea that, that uh, psychedelics acutely allow more parts of the brain to be communicating is very compelling. And you've probably all seen this very sexy photo. This is just another way of, or picture. This is another way of trying to capture this, which is if these are all the networks, usually they, some of them are communicating across, but on psychedelics, lots of them are. So that's a, it's a compelling story. I would say it's still evolving, but um, there does seem to be something like that, certainly acutely. This paper recently came out in um, Nature Neuroscience. It's fairly contentious, but I think it's pretty interesting. This is, uh, in, this, in this paper, what they did is they took resting state fMRI, and they calculated a single metric for people called brain modularity. So this was similar to what I was just showing you, but they got a single number about how um, modular the activities in the brain, like how much separate circuits are going, or how like, a, like no brain modularity would be everything talking to everything. And then they showed that in their open label trial, 
that it typically goes down after psilocybin treatment and how much it goes down correlates with how much people get better. So that was interesting. And then they looked at another data set. This isn't a placebo controlled trial. Well, not placebo, escitalopram was a control condition. And they saw something, they saw the same pattern. But if you look at it a little bit, people got kind of upset about this because you know, there are more people here. They're different at baseline, um, the two groups. And uh, you know, some people argued about the statistics. So I would say it's, a, it's an evolving field, but there does seem to be some story here. You know, the DMN, the you know, default mode network has also been talked about a lot. Um, I think this is still a space where we are trying to figure it out, but it, it, it is very exciting. So then just the last thing I wanna talk about is um, uh, methamphetamine disease disorder. So this is uh, something that we're working on where um, I think I can make the case that you know, methamphetamine is very popular <laughs> and it causes a lot of trouble, uh, both me you know, mental health, physical health, it's a huge cost for society. And there are very few, there are no effective pharmacotherapies for methamphetamine use disorder. Um, the only treatments are things like contingency management and psychosocial treatments, and those are not very good. They're not very effective, sorry. Um, I showed you some data that uh, people with histories of meth use can take psilocybin without obvious adverse events. Um, I showed you some data that psilocybin can help with other uh, substance use disorders. Uh, and, you know, I hinted, I didn't really get into it, but I think you've seen other places that there are a bunch of reasons to think that these treatments might allow for the plasticity and psychological change to allow people to, to quit using meth. So we received uh, some intramural funding to do the first trial of psilocybin for methamphetamine use disorder, and uh, we're hoping to recruit uh, in the fall. Uh, so I think that's that's all I, uh, I have prepared, but I, I would love to talk, answer any questions or, or talk about any of this. Well, I guess I also want to, yeah, thank you. I also want to thank all the people that helped me do the work, actually. Uh, so these are all those people. So thank you so much. Very, very nice, interesting talk. I have a couple of questions. Maybe I didn't catch. In your HIV trial, um, group setting was really, I think, a daring setup. You did. <laughs> I would say it was, uh, we were, we, it was one of those things we didn't realize uh, how brave we, we, you know, like it, we didn't know how difficult it was going to be. <laughs> right. so my, question, like, my question is that you, after you started the trial, I mean, yeah. you, you got the patients grouped and all that. Did you have any dropouts? No. Oh, wow. okay. So that was one thing that was pretty easy. We had 100% um, adherent. Uh, some people missed a couple sessions, but we had zero dropouts. Um, and the, and the people who missed the session, well, I think it was 95% adherence to, to pretty involved uh, inter, uh, intervention. And those were things like one guy got a, rec a recurrence of cancer. So they like, had pretty good reasons for not being able to come to those visits. But they were definitely in communication with us, uh, which we, that was a big part of the study because these people are, the people in the study were pretty sick and isolated. Um, and so, yeah, I would say even broader than that, as opposed to all the other trials I've ever worked on, people are, it's just like a different world for the people who want to participate in these psychedelic trials. And it's like, I don't know how to put it exactly, but it, people are knocking down our doors to be in these trials. If you can comment on their uh, sex ratio and also the uh, HIV status, I appreciate that. Oh, so in, well, in the HIV study, they were all gay men. Yeah, so we, we decided that, that was a kind of tricky thing, you know, because, you know, you don't usually like to you know, we, we, we don't want to just study men, but but we felt like um, that it, given the historical aspects and the sort of demographics and we wanted to have homogeneous groups, we were worried about doing a group therapy where we, but actually we found that the, 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 the homogeneity was so high, <laughs> actually we could have, we could have had more um, diversity in the groups, but the people, they were actually, they all, some of them actually knew each other from, from their social networks distantly, but it, yeah, that was probably unnecessary, if that makes sense. So, you know, we were going to do more. We wanted to do a study with, you know, allowing women and you know, different aspects, but we just we didn't have funding for that. All, all HIV positive. Oh, they were all well controlled. They had to be, they had to be well controlled on, on uh, antiretrovirals to be in the study, but they were on different ones. And that was another thing we were a little bit nervous about, but we didn't have any issues with. 
Other questions? Yeah. Uh, yeah. Thanks for your talk. Uh, I had a question kind of inspired by multiple points. Mm. So you mentioned the founder of AA you said it was partially inspired by LSD use. Apparently um, that's what he said. I mean, <laughs> the HIV study, the folks in there were wanting the community. Um, so I'm wondering it. Oh, I've also heard other uh, practitioners or patients have talked about this thing of, you know, we always talk about set and setting. So I think about, you know, the therapist's office in some cases is good, but in some cases people may want to be in a different setting or with you mean like nature or, or I'm thinking more specifically about the group. So like, uh, yeah. loved ones sure. or, um, or in the context of what you were saying, or like a cohort, like for, I don't want to say the meth study is like a weird topic to say that, but in any, <laughs> any group. So I'm just, yeah. my, my question is like, what do you, will that ever come? Is that a thing? Uh, I, it's a really interesting idea. So, so, you know, the set and setting jargon actually came from Timothy Leary. And there was also this talk of the matrix before the movie, you know, <laughs> it's not that matrix. And you know, when, when they were talking about the matrix, they were talking about like the community that you were in, that you went back to. Um, and I think this is a really interesting aspect. So in our study with the groups, even though that we were dosing them separately, they kind of, they, there was a very powerful camaraderie and sort of we're going through this together. And they, they actually spontaneously started doing this thing where they were writing letters to each other that each person who dosed would open a letter from the previous person and then write a letter for the next person. So this is like something that spontaneously happened. And we were like, wow, that's right. And, and, you know, I think this is, and, and, you know, there's a study in Toronto uh, where they're doing couples with MDMA. Um, so, you know, this, this is something that I think is definitely uh, important. Um, exactly how to do it in a sort of clinical trial setting is it's really complicated, <laughs> right? I do know of a clinic, a ketamine clinic, where they do create, they, they, they give people the ketamine treatment and then they create these sort of long-term support groups where they're sort of more experienced people and more junior people. And they say that that's very powerful, but I don't know how you would study such a thing. Even the groups were really hard for us to do because you had to get people all at once, right? And get them through the study. So logistically it was challenging. And then the data points are no longer independent, right? Because now the people are influencing each other. So that's just, it, there's just like, it, it's just logistically challenging. So how to do what you're talking about. I don't, I don't know. <laughs> you know, I, I think, uh, I, I agree with what you're saying. I, I don't know the protocol, but I just think it's interesting in this, you know, mild clash we have. One of the other speakers was mentioning, there's like this clash between the culture, culture, psychedelics culture and the historicals mm. in the modern medical renaissance. Um, so maybe that somehow like, well, that, that is something I grapple with all the time. And I, I do try and like in my group. So, you know, I am the director of this program at UCSF called the translational psychedelic research program. Tripper is our, you know, is our accurate, is how we call it. And, you know, we do bring these people together. We bring people who are like expert psychedelic therapists, and then we bring non non clinical researchers. And you know, I'm a biological psychiatrist. I've never been to Burning Man, so I'm kind of square. You know, I'm like you know, when I'm like trying to do this work, and you know, take care of the patients and do good therapy, but also collect reliable data and be rigorous and and consistent. And there are these different worldviews that really clash, and 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 it's difficult. It's really difficult. You know. I can talk about it at length, but like one thing I think about sometimes is for some people, this is like a religious practice, right? And so I, you know, I think like, oh, what would happen if I was like, oh, you know, I, I think Catholicism looks pretty promising as a treatment. Like I want to study the choir music, you know, <laughs> like I just want to study one part of your religion as a treatment. You know, people would get upset about that. Um, and yet these are drugs and I think there is promise. I'm not saying we shouldn't. It's just, it, it, is, a, it is a tricky issue. Uh, and then there's also a lot of lore because I think as everyone's been talking about, all this stuff was driven underground. And so there are these people who kept kind of kept it alive and there's this like wisdom, you know, lore, but some of that lore is true and some of it isn't, <laughs> you know, I remember there's one thing, um, uh, a group at, at Yale, they were getting ready to start dosing with psychedelics and they had a dosing room and they had a, a sink in their dosing room, right? Uh, Cause it was an exam room. And, and some of the people were like, oh my God, you can't have a sink in your dosing room. <laughs> you know, like that's gonna ruin the, the vibe. And then the people are like, well, prove to prove that to me. And this was like a, one of those tensions of these different worlds, you know? Uh, so that's the sort of thing that, that comes in. And, and, you know, it's hard to, 
test, any of those things. Or another thing is the music. Like all the modern trials have people listening to music, the psychedelic, you know, psilocybin trials. And you know, people get pretty worked up about this. Like, what's what what should the music be? And should it have lyrics or not lyrics? And you know, um, what's the, the playlist? But like, and then the patients often say that music is very powerful. They say, oh, that was really they will say spontaneously, oh yeah, the music provided this thing, I could experience in this new, but like, is it do you really need the music? Like, no one's gonna do that trial, probably. <laughs> right. So, so there's a lot of things like that. Or right, maybe more relevant to this group, SSRIs. So this is a big problem, right? All the trials of psilocybin, people have been off of SSRIs. And, um, you know, there was this thought that you might call, cause serotonin syndrome. And so that made, kind of made sense. But now it doesn't seem to be the case. People don't, right? But the other lore is that if you're on an SSRI, you'll blunt the subjective effects of psychedelics. That's the lore. And, you know, we, we are in the process of doing a, a Reddit study where we're looking and kind of systematically looking at all the comments. And yeah, it's true. Lots and lots of people on Reddit say, um, if I'm on an SSRI, I take mushrooms, it doesn't work that well. Lots and lots of people say that. But two trials just came out where they took healthy people and they randomized them to be put on an SSRI or not. And then everyone got psilocybin and it didn't seem to matter. And then they also another trial where they took depressed people on SSRIs and they and they did they got high just like everybody else. So like maybe it's not true. So I mean these are the kind of things like like it, like how do you know stuff? I mean that's a, <laughs> I mean that's kind of a philosophical like trippy thing. But like you know like you talk to the therapist and they're like oh I know this because I've worked with patients and then there's this lore. And yeah and so we're trying to grapple with those things. I think I may have gone a little off topic. Sorry. <laughs> uh, really appreciated the response. Thank you. Yeah. Uh, Josh, can I ask you this since you're a trialist? Yeah, sure. Uh, have you cracked the issue around uh, uh, appropriate comparators? Oh, yeah, that's a great question. Um, I'm glad you asked. Uh, well, we haven't done a trial that uh, uh, cracks this thing. I have some ideas for how to do it, uh, but, you know, kind of piggybacking on, piggybacking on the, the previous discussion about, like, what's been holding up the research. I mean, I understand industry and, and like, I've had the same you know, industry I've been kind of adjacent to, uh, but you know, the government you know, mostly funds research and the government has not funded any of this research. So I've been dependent on philanthropy and you know, that's been interesting and I'm very appreciative of it. But you know, there's some questions that have, no one's been wanting to fund. Uh, and so you know, when, we, when I, ha I have these ideas, like to, to really do the most rigorous really try to nail this, nail down this, this problem of, you know, expectation, people know what they're getting, people get nocebo effects when they don't get what they want. That's clearly happening. But I don't think the FDA hasn't been enforcing anything. They mostly kind of, my impression is they kind of just throw their hands up. They're like, that sounds like a hard problem. I don't know. Right. <laughs> right. Um, and so like, who, who cares enough to actually do that? Right. And when I've talked to industry, Mostly they say, well, that's not going to be required for us to get our drug approved, which is probably true. <laughs> but so then we're kind of left in this position. I think it's a huge problem. I, you know, we just had a paper come out where we kind of outline these problems and talk about why, why do we use control conditions and, and how, you know, expectation, how might you manage it? I think that there are some pretty clever ways of, kind of, to do it with very active placebos and deception or incomplete disclosure, excuse, excuse me. Um, but no one has done it. And, you know, the, the few attempts that have been made, I mean, the Hopkins group has done the best job, you know, and they've done what I thought was pretty clever. They, they had this microdose as the single dose, so they could tell everyone you're definitely going to get psilocybin, and they kept their own staff blinded to that. And I can tell you that's very, very challenging to do, to keep your own staff unaware of what people are actually getting. It's a very tricky thing. So that was a good start, but everyone knew that they weren't high, right? So you have to do something more aggressive than that. So we have some ideas. If, if, if uh, you know, Charles River wants to uh, fund some work in this, I'm happy to do it. <laughs> <laughs> Other questions, are they? I think we're running out oh, of time. Oh, we have to stop, sorry. Yeah, um, of course. Thank you so much. You have so many great stories. Uh, 